Hello, I'm Alina. Hello, I'm Janine. We're two sisters, two PhDs, relentlessly curious about too many things. This is Sister Doctor Squared. Episode 16 of Sister Doctor Squared. My name is Alina, and before we kick things off, we would like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera people as the traditional owners of the land where we are recording this episode. We are coming to you from Mianjin country, and we pay our respects to Elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening today. Now, Janine, Sister, please introduce the episode for the Squares. Thank you, Alina. So this episode is all around Tourette's Syndrome, and in Australia, the 2nd to the 8th of May is actually Tourette's Syndrome Awareness Week. So we were really keen to do this episode and try and time with that. And I have mentioned on the podcast before, but my boy actually has Tourette's Syndrome. So I've personally learned so much about this condition over the past few years, but I know there is so much more for the public to learn and understand about this complex condition. So in this episode, what we really want to do is some awareness raising and some myth busting with a little bit of science peppered in, of course. And we are super psyched to have our first guest joining the podcast. He'll be with us in a moment. Yes. (laughs) But first things first, we need to cover what is Tourette's syndrome. So we're going to do things a little differently in this episode rather than covering individual scientific studies in some depth. What we'll do is just pull together a few different sources of information about Tourette's to cover some general facts because we think many people are somewhat familiar with Tourette's syndrome, but there's still plenty of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. So what is Tourette's syndrome? Well, Tourette's syndrome is a neurological condition. It's a type of tic disorder where a person will have involuntary, sudden, recurrent movements and vocalisations. These are called tics. Tics change over weeks, months, years, and they also wax and wane over time in terms of frequency. Now there's motor tics. These are movements of the body, which might be something like blinking, jaw movements, shoulder shrugging. And then there's vocal tics, which are sounds. And these might be things like sniffing, grunting, throat clearing, and other sounds. With both motor and vocal tics, these can be called either simple or complex. The ones I've just mentioned, blinking, sniffing, and throat clearing are simple tics. And then complex tics are just that. They're more complex. So complex motor tics might include coordinated movements of the body, like jumping, hopping, And in more extreme cases, maybe even something like doing repeated backflips or forward rolls. And then complex vocal tics might be particular strings of words or phrases that the person often says that are out of context. Now, Tourette's is often portrayed in the media as people yelling and screaming obscenities, which kind of gives the impression that everybody with Tourette's syndrome does this. This is a total misconception This is called coprolalia, and these types of tics happen for only around 10 to 15% of people with Tourette's syndrome. So Tourette's syndrome, myth number one, busted. Not everyone with Tourette's yells and screams obscenities. Yes, and I'll just jump in there that there's also another element of Tourette's called copropraxia, and that is where people may have obscene gestures or inappropriate touching. So it could be, for example, giving the finger in an inappropriate situation. And similarly, at most, 21% of those with Tourette's will display this copropraxia element. Yeah, that's right. And so it's really a lot less common than you're probably imagining. Mm. And in any case, listeners and squares, just remember that tics are completely involuntary. A person with Tourette's who, let's say, swears at you or says something kind of inappropriate has no intention to hurt or offend or to be obnoxious. These tics are involuntary. This is a neurological condition. So some other facts about Tourette's syndrome, tics generally start during childhood around age five or six. How severe the Tourette's is varies a lot from person to person. For some people, tics are quite mild and for others, they can be very difficult to deal with. So how common is Tourette's? I did find one systematic review from 2014 that helps to answer this question. And squares <laughs> who have followed the podcast will know how much I love a systematic <laughs> review because the prevalence of Tourette's syndrome varies a lot from study to study. And 
what a systematic review does is bring together all the different estimates to essentially find the average. The methods and statistics are a lot more sophisticated than that. But in essence, that's what it's trying to do yeah. to determine our best estimate of the prevalence in truth. So this systematic review was by Jeremiah Sharfus and colleagues, and it looked at the population prevalence of Tourette's in children, and it estimated this to be between 0.3 and 0.9%. Now, this is likely to be an underestimate because of the shortcomings of the studies included. So I think we can say 1% and possibly more, up to 1% mm -hmm. and possibly more, which would equate to around 1 in 100 yep. children. Now, it's really hard to know the prevalence of Tourette's in adults. There isn't enough research on this. I did find one study that indicated a prevalence of Tourette's in adults to be less than one in 1,000. Wow, really? Yeah, but of course, this is just a single study in just one population in Canada. So we just can't be sure. We do need more research on that. Yeah. And then the last fact I will raise is studies have shown that Tourette's syndrome is more common in males than females. And that seems to be the case for both children and adults. Janine, do we know any more about what's going on there? Yeah, I did do a little bit of research around this. Essentially, there is no single explanation for this pattern, but there is some evidence to suggest that there may be differences in brain connectivity and also grey matter volume in the brain, which we know does differ between the sexes, so that may be implicated, but nothing really concrete. I also found some interesting information around Tourette's in girls where there can be a tendency for the tics to become increasingly more complex as girls age, but there doesn't seem to be the same trajectory or pattern in boys. Mm, okay. But yeah, nothing concrete as to why, but that does seem to be a consistent pattern, at least in the literature. Interesting. All right, so that's kind of a general overview of what is Tourette's from a textbook perspective, but it's one thing to hear about Tourette's syndrome from scientific articles. It's another thing to actually hear from someone who has Tourette's. So we are so thrilled to welcome our very first guest on Sister Doctor Square. Yay! Yes! <laughs> he is many things. Most recently, a very accomplished and inspiring public speaker. He is an energetic ambassador for the Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia. He has worked on Breakfast Radio. He's done stand-up comedy. And folks in Australia might know his awesome work on television, on Toasted TV, Totally Wild, and The Project. Please welcome the amazing Mr. Seamus Evans. Yay! Yay! <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much for having me. What a great introduction. Thanks, Seamus. We're super excited to have you with us. So we first met you at Tourette's Camp, which we will talk a little bit more about Tourette's Camp a bit later. But I, yeah. I just wanted to kick off by asking you about when you were first diagnosed with Tourette's and what the journey yeah. has been like ever since. So first of all, before I go into that, I want to say I really like the use of the language you guys are using around Tourette, so calling it a condition. Yes. I always say condition. I know a lot of people, I mean, whether the doctors or science declare it this or not, it mm. doesn't matter. Mm. I never use the word disorder or disability ever mm -hmm. because I, I I personally, I believe so much in uh, the, the power of language. Absolutely. I don't want to, I just don't like the word this because I don't like the idea of uh, it's, it's a problem. Having, yeah, I don't mm. like the idea of Tourette's being something to stop you from doing anything or, mm -hmm. or you know, having that, just that word dis in front mm. of it. I just don't like uh, uh, relating it to that. So no disorder. I never call it a disorder or a disability. It's always a condition. Mm -hmm. And also just listening to what you were saying about in the females. Mm. So I remember talking to someone recently and they said that the reason why they say it's less common in girls because I went to camp recently with you mm -hmm. guys. Yep. And there are so many females yes. that have Tourette's. Yes. And I was like, surely that statistic can't be real. Yes. And I remember someone saying it's because typically females can mask it. They can mask ADHD, ah. they can mask autism, and they can mask Tourette's better than boys. So it doesn't ah. show up. Or in the studies, in the research, that mm -hmm. it just it doesn't show up. Mm. Or they can mask it. So because I remember looking around going, that has to be wrong. Because mm. the amount of the male to female ratio at camp yep. is definitely not more common in boys and girls. But, you know, as you've mentioned, you know, there isn't enough data, there isn't no. enough research conducted to actually have these answers uh, incredibly accurate. Yeah, and that's true. But anyway, back to your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was, I, I was diagnosed at the age of 10. 
Okay. But I was born with it. So mm-hmm. when I was a baby, I wasn't an infant. I kept wriggling my nose <laughs> and sniffing uh. like that. And my sister called me Snuffleupagus. <laughs> and they just, <laughs> I mean, they didn't get bad until I remember distinctly, you know, around that seven years of age. Yes. Between seven to nine. Yes. They were really intense. Like, being really overwhelmed and freaking out. I remember being in the kitchen upstairs, actually in this very house, and not being able to stop shaking my hands and flicking my head going, what the hell's mm-hmm. happening? Mm-hmm. And everyone's freaking out like, well, why can't you stop it? And I was getting so overwhelmed. I ran away into like another room and I just couldn't stop. Yes. And I was like crying and I was like, what the hell is happening to me? And mum mum was really, really great because she, would, you know, she knelt down and got in front of me and was like, it's okay. Yes. And kind of talked me off the ledge as I was so, my emotions were so high and I was freaking out. And then after that, we kind of realised, because it was starting to impede me and my Mm -hmm. life Mm -hmm. and it was starting to affect my mental health. Yes. And and I remember we never, we just accepted it and it was fine. Like it wasn't a problem. We just, it was something, I mean, I'm I'm one of four kids. Uh I was the youngest. So there was a very busy, active household back then with a lot of things going on. Some teenage angst amongst my brothers. (laughs) And a teenage girl, it was, <laughs> you know. So there was a lot happening. And then I ne- I was going to bed and before going to bed, we were saying our prayers mm-hmm. and I said, God, take my ticks away. Mm. And I remember years later my mum told me that that really broke her. She mm-hmm. was really hurt by that. Mm-hmm. And so then we actually, we watched a doc. no, my nana watched a documentary on 60 Minutes and she was like, she called us straight away and said, watch this doco. That's what Seamus has. Because okay. in the 90s, you know, 1996, 97, yes, 98, yes. we had no idea what no, the hell it was. Yeah. So, and then we had, a, okay, well, maybe it's this thing. So then we went to GPs and then specialists. Yes. And then finally, at the age of 10, I remember the 10th birthday was quite a big one because I had, I had just been diagnosed. And really? So, yeah, I got diagnosed at 10. Okay. But I was born with it. So I've had it forever. Yes. And it's really interesting because I speak to a lot of, um, parents where their children have just been diagnosed within mm-hmm. the last six months yes. or developed ticks a lot and so many kids have developed ticks since COVID since yeah. lockdown because it's a traumatic mm. experience that they're going through they can't leave the house and it's a you know it's a change so they struggle with it mm-hmm. and then the parents are like you've never done this before mm. but since lockdown you're ticking how are we going to go back at school uh-huh. anyway the parents freak out And I speak to a lot of them and they say, essentially, how do I stop it? Mm, (laughs) And and I have to very carefully brace, you know, break the news that, oh, no, there is no stopping. That's right. It's just Mm. you have to learn how to uh, deal with it. You've got to learn how to Mm -hmm. adjust to it. You've got to learn how to accept it. And unfortunately, it's not you, but it's your child who has to learn how to manage it, accept it and go through that journey themselves. Yes. And uh, I forgot my point. Uh, maybe it's because the ADHD's kicked in and I got distracted. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but that's right. My point was I've got 31 years of experience mm-hmm. with ticks and Tourette's. Yes, yes. So now at this age, I'm quite experienced with managing the ticks. Yes. Whereas when I meet a parent and their kid's just been diagnosed or developed it six yes. months ago, yes. they are inexperienced. And yes. I, even yeah. in the last 12 months being a part of the Tourette syndrome community, I have learned that so many people are at different stages. Mm. So I meet people who, you know, they've had it for 20 years, but they're probably not at the stage of the acceptance journey or of, you know, mm. they're still hating it not liking yes. it, running away from it, and therefore probably not managing it. Mm-hmm. But my really, my acceptance journey properly started in the when I was about 18 when I had to learn how to curb it for my career. I was yes. on television. Yes. Uh, but after speaking with my mother, when I was younger, I was able to really manage my tics as, from a young age. Interesting. It's a weird thing because... It's really, I have found it mood dependent. If I feel like, if I don't care, if I'm in a mood where I'm really confident and I don't care, I won't mask it because I don't care and I'm confident and it's not not bothering me. But if I'm in situations where maybe that particular day I wasn't confident or I was, you know, having a hard day, whatever it might Mm be, I would mask it or I would manage them a lot more. Mm -hmm. And especially when it came to uh, being a teenager and discovering girls. Mm. You know, sometimes if I liked a girl, I wouldn't tick in front of them. Yes. And others I would. And so, yeah, it it really, looking back, 
it was mood dependent on when I wanted to manage it and when I didn't. That's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, so I can relate to a lot of what you've talked about as being the mother of someone with Mm. Tourette's. So he was diagnosed around age six. We were quite Mm. fortunate in that we got the diagnosis relatively fast. In some families, it can take some time. His, um, at that age, he'd had a cold and it had resolved, but he just kept sniffing and clearing his throat for weeks. And we were going, what, why are you doing that? Can you, can you stop doing that? And he, he was old mm-hmm. enough to be able to say, I can't stop. I just have to do it. I have to do it all day. I think, mm-hmm. okay. Um, so we went to the GP and fortunately the GP had a pretty good insight as to it was most likely something like Tourette. So sent us to a neurologist and we got that diagnosis. But in hindsight... He was absolutely ticking from as early as one. I can remember him blinking all the time and scrunching his face up like you're describing. So I don't think technically he would have had Tourette's that early, but he had tics, absolutely. And his case, I mean, you've met my little boy. His case is quite Mm. mild. A lot of people wouldn't realise he has Tourette's, but there are certainly times when it does ramp up and it's very obvious. Um, And at those times he would start doing things like squealing, he mm. will, when he's walking, he will have to make his legs bash into each other as he's walking. Yes, um, I've done this one. Yes, and there's a squeak, which is actually quite cute. And then there's the owl. Oh, favorite. that's my favorite one of his. No, tics, my favorite. Just say? <laughs> my favorite is the owl, where he just go, hoo, hoo. Ooh, it's quite soothing yeah. and lovely. I was like, oh, yes. the owl's back, yay. <laughs> so, I said, can you do that to help me get to sleep, mate? That's really nice. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, and yes, I can also relate to the, your explanation of the parents because when you mm. find out there's sort of two journeys going on, the child is having to learn what this is and how am I going to manage this and so are the parents. Parents are having to learn about it and accepting it. It was a difficult time. It really was. But then once you do get to that acceptance point, it's it's fine and it's kind of yeah. there's a lot of silver lining. So I think we'll get into that some of that soon. Yeah. Well, I think I think it kind of I mean, I don't know, I'm not a parent, but I dare yeah. say it falls into the category of um, oh no, there's something wrong with my child. Yes. And and I, I don't know, but I dare say maybe falling into a sense of embarrassment of oh no, you know, there's something wrong with our kid. And mm. going through that denial phase, which being a part of camp, I know a few people who one parent was in the denial phase, there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with them, mm-hmm. and others were, you know, being with them. And, yeah, unfortunately for the parents, and I don't know this feeling, but unfortunately for the parents, it's not actually the parent's journey to go through, but mm. it's a parent journey. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I know the sense that I had was just this really sense of dread of this is not what I wanted for him. Yeah. It just, could just sense he's going to have a lot more challenges in his life than he otherwise would have. That was my sense. You know what, though? On what you just said then, mm. and, and so many people, when I, when I launched into this keynote speaking career, being an ambassador, mm-hmm. you know, the reason why is when I was in radio, I, I said this story to someone. My boss at the time, I said, oh, yeah, I've got Tourette's. I learned how to, you know, control it and man- manage it to mm-hmm. be on television. They said, that's a really impressive story. That's so amazing what you went through. And I'm like, well, is it? I don't know. It's because it's just something I did. Yeah, it's, it's normal. your normal. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just normal for me. Yes. So to someone else who hasn't experienced that side of adversity or mm-hmm. that side of a challenge they've got to overcome, mm. it might be impressive. But to that individual, they don't know any different. Mm. So it, it's, it's a weird, it was a weird uh, moment of thinking about it going, hang on, what's so impressive about it? Because mm. I didn't know because to me it was just this is, what I have to do Mm -hmm. to be like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully now you do feel a sense of pride around what you've managed to achieve because it's pretty awesome. We're going to talk a little bit more about that soon. I, of course, I don't know if you know this, Seamus. I think I may have mentioned this. My background is evolution and genetics. Yes. So I I just can't help myself. We need to get into some of the genetics of Tourette's. I loved our chat that we had at camp. We... (laughs) What, we were there for like an hour talking about <laughs> millipedes yep. and some of their horrific yes. sexual behaviour. Yes, we were. I was so glad you brought that up, Seamus, because we <laughs> do need to, we've yet to do an episode on Janine's millipede research. That's right. So that's in the works. That it is coming. coming. I know. It's, um, it is fascinating, right? <laughs> I love it. I love the animal world. I fell in love with the animal world when I worked on Totally Wild because yes. I'd research animals all day, every day. Yes. I'd have learned how to hyper-focus and I would just become absorbed into this weird animal. 
Yeah. And yeah, I love it. It's good. So, well, so yeah, so I did do some, and I've been obviously looking into the genetics of this since my boy was diagnosed because I'm just very mm. interested in that side of things generally. There is a genetic component to Tourette's in that it does tend to run in families, but it is a lot more complex than that. So for example, if we have identical twins where they've been studied, if one in that pair of twins has Tourette's, we only see Tourette's in the other twin a maximum of 53% of the time. That's very interesting. So Wait a second. Can I dissect that a second? Go, for, go so ahead. So the other twin only has 53% of Tourette's or no. the gene? No, it, it is that if we looked across, let's say we had 100 sets of identical twins. Yeah. And we've got in all of them, at least one twin has Tourette's. Mm-hmm. The other twin would only also have Tourette's in 53 of them, in 53 of the pairs. Oh, Which okay. Is okay, a okay, lot less sense. than we would expect. That's a lot less than you identical would twins. You would expect it to be one hundred percent of the time they both have Tourette's. Yeah, you would or think both do not have Tourette's because identical twins have identical genomes. They have identical DNA. So if there was, let's say, there was a Tourette's gene, and it's in the twins, they would both show Tourette's. But it's not like that. So it's wow. very interesting. It's much more complicated. So hang on, just to get my head around twins and their identical DNA. Yes. So if I had a, this is such a full on question, but it's. <laughs> I it's hope good. I could answer it. <laughs> so I don't have a twin, an identical twin, but if I did yes. and I had a partner, and my identical twin and my partner conceived a child, that child would have my DNA. If I got a blood test, yeah, that child is mine. Because it's my DNA, but it's not mine. Yeah, the, the genome's identical. In, in identical twins. It's true. So it's my kid without... So if I took that kid, <laughs> if my partner had an affair with my twin brother and I took that kid to get a blood test, it would come up as mine. Well, yeah, you wouldn't know which of the two it is. That's correct. Well, lucky I don't have an evil twin brother who's going <laughs> to force my partner to have an affair. <laughs> Uh, is he? Genetics is cool, right? Anyway. That's very fascinating. It is. So, yeah, what we're seeing is there's definitely not one single gene. If there was one single gene for Tourette's, we would call it monogenic inheritance and we would say, you have the gene, you have Tourette's. It's not like that. So there is there is some more recent studies suggesting that there are most likely multiple genes involved. So then we call it polygenic inheritance. So this is much more complicated. That's where we need to see a mixture of different genes present. But then they don't seem to guarantee getting Tourette's either. What seems to be happening is that there can be what we would call an environmental trigger. So you may have this sort of mixture of genes where you're predisposed to developing Tourette's and mm. then something may trigger it. And then we get into this territory of what's called epigenetics, which is super fascinating. And I'm going to resist that tangent because I could speak about that for several hours. We're going to resist that right now. But hopefully this is making sense. One of the things implicated is the immune system. So there is a little bit of evidence that having particular infection early in life could, for example, turn on a gene or several genes or turn off important genes. And that could lead to the development of Tourette's and other conditions as well. And what might be going on there is that when the immune system is activated, just in a natural way, a lot of chemicals are released in the body that trigger inflammation. And they could be triggering a change in the brain or they could be triggering changes in what genes are turned on and off. So that's pretty interesting. So we don't have a clear sense of... We, we can't really get... If you're having a baby, you can get their genome sequenced. You could actually get that. But you wouldn't at this point be able to say your child is going to get Tourette's. We don't have that capability yet. And maybe we never will. It reminds me of what you were saying earlier before with COVID, Seamus, because some yes. people might have this genetic predisposition and it might be the stress of yes, lockdown that absolutely. might, for some people, trigger that tick's developing. That's absolutely yeah. true, yep. Well, yeah, one of the guys at camp, he's 23 and he got it a year ago. He got it, he got mm. it you know, eight months ago, I think it was. Yes. He, he left He left his family home and left Melbourne, mm-hmm. driving up to Queensland, bang. I mean, he said he'd always always had ticks, yes. but it was as he was driving up. He was like, whoa, like way more. Wow. He just thought, you know, he'd, he'd have to whistle or click his fingers before writing an email. Mm-hmm. And then as he was driving, it just inflamed. And I mean, and, and when people hear the word trauma, they think, what has happened to this child? Yes. You know, it's a, it, it happens after a traumatic event. It's like, oh, my gosh, is the child okay? Yes. But it could be. I remember speaking to the president of Tourette's Syndrome Association mm-hmm. Australia, Mandy. She said it could be as simple as 
being a baby in a pram and a car beeps their horn next to it. Mm. It's a very loud noise. Mm. And for a baby, they'd go, whoa, what was that? Mm-hmm. And that could trigger mm. it. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's not necessarily a, an extreme No, that's right. Event. Well, it yeah. Trigger it. it can just be simple. Absolutely. Some sort of stress on the body. Yes. You know? Puberty. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, well, it's interesting you raise that because I know that ticks can definitely ramp right up at puberty. Yeah. And then in some, I think in some people they come back down, but in others it stays at that higher level. So, yeah, there's a lot going on there and that could be hormonal influence but also just the stress of all the change going on. It could be a mixture yeah. of all of these things. I remember when I was growing up and that those puberty years, yes. it was always up and down. So I remember mm. what you said before, your son is quite mild yep. and it varies. Yep. Sometimes, like when I was around puberty, it peaked so much mm. and then it dipped down mm-hmm. and then three months later it would peak again. I'm mm-hmm. like, what's going on? And I saw the pattern of it, you know, really getting extreme and then dropping off. And yes. really, like it's just a cycle. Yes. That it just every now and then will get more inflamed and others it won't. Yep, yep, that seems to be the case. Yeah, and it, like in the, the neurology, in the literature, they call that waxing and waning. That's the, the terminology they give around that. And that does seem to be one of the only things they can guarantee when you have Tourette's is that it will wax and wane. They can't really guarantee what the extent of it will be and when these things will happen, it is just going to cycle around like you described. Yeah, there's no common trajectories there. So I also found when I was looking at the genetics research, there's really strong evidence of links with other conditions. So Mm. this is what we would call comorbidities. I don't really like that word. It sounds quite negative, but (laughs) in the research (laughs) that is the word being used. This means that having Tourette seems to increase the likelihood of having other conditions. The most commonly observed are ADHD and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And Seamus already mentioned you have ADHD, is that right? Yes. Yep. ADHD and and I have OCD related tics. Yes. So I don't have the cleaning OCD where I've got to turn the light on and off 10 no. times. Yes. But I have Uh, OCD-related tics where everything has to be even. So if I touch something with one hand, touching it with the other. Yes. That that waxes and what? Weans? Wanes, yes. (laughs) Wanes. That waxes and wanes as well. Yes. Yes. It's really interesting. And some of the other conditions are anxiety and depression is also Mm -hmm. more commonly observed and also being on the autism spectrum. And in fact, 85% of those with Tourette's will have at least at least one of these other comorbid conditions um, and most commonly, as I said, ADHD and OCD. Yeah. So really Tourette's then it effectively becomes much bigger than just Tourette's in terms of its impact on most of the people. Yeah. And there are ongoing studies into the causes and the triggers of Tourette's. I would now like us to move into unpacking some of those misconceptions and doing some myth busting. So Alina and I did some brainstorming around things we've heard in our journey Mm. with this. And the first one I wanted to raise is that people often are like, oh, come on, surely you can control this. So Seamus, what would you say to someone who's saying, oh, come on, you can control this, just stop doing it? What would you say? The short answer is you cannot stop it, right? You can't control it. What I was taught from a young age is I can't stop it, but I can turn the volume down. Mm. And so instead of stopping it completely, because that's called suppressing, Mm -hmm. it's the same as not blinking. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, it's going to hurt your eyes. It's really stressful. Don't do it, right? Yes. Let it out. But what I learned from a young age is turning the volume down. So, for example, um, the big grunt like that, instead of really heavily grunting, I would... Ah. Slow it down. Try and get that. And the way I describe it is it's getting a sensation. So it's like putting a cotton bud in your ear to get that earwax. You need to get that earwax. So so if you're grunting, if it's the, <clears throat> then see if you can get that satisfaction another mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I learned how to manage them, manipulate them and redirect them was not exploring the actual movement of the tick, but the satisfaction that I was after. Ah. And so, for example, the knocking the knees. So I always bang, knock my knees all the time, my heels, the whole thing. And I used to do it so much as a kid and big bruises on my knees. Mm -hmm. But now as I'm older, I don't want to do that because it hurts. So Mm -hmm. what I do is I have worked out the sensation is the feeling against the knees and the way my uh, hips feel in the groin. So Mm -hmm. I'll put my hand, how do I explain this without it being visual? I put my palm on one knee mm-hmm. and 
uh, going straight across like a straight bar, my elbow on the other one. Ah. And I press my knees into that pole that is my arm. Okay. And it clicks the heel, sorry, clicks the hips in the groin and also gets that satisfaction on the knees. Yes. So without banging them, I can still get the same satisfaction out of it. Yes. But in order to do that, and this is where it gets really complicated yes. with someone who has Tourette's and where they are in their journey. Yes. Because if they're not going through the acceptance period, they're in denial, they're frustrated, they don't like it, they let it happen or whatever, mm -hmm. What I had to do was register them. So I'd go, okay, I have that tick. But how can I then get that satisfaction? And it's just like solving a problem, mm -hmm. right? You're going to come up with a few different roadblocks before you get the solution. Mm -hmm. You're going to come up with a few different errors and, and, and whatever, but you just have to explore the different areas. And, and that's okay. how I was able to redirect them into other ticks by that exploration mm. phase. That's really interesting. So yeah, so rather than if you tried one thing and it didn't work, I guess you could just get frustrated and go, oh, this is never going to get better and I can't control this. Whereas you've yeah. gone, well, I'll keep exploring this. I'll try something else. I'll try something else. Yes. It's like, it's like um, what Bruce Lee says, you've got to be like water. Mm -hmm. So that movement has to happen. Mm -hmm. But how it happens, I learned I could control how it happened. Mm -hmm. I still had to do it. Mm -hmm. I had to get it done. I had to tick the box. Yes, but I could control how I did it. Yeah, and I think it's really important that you explain that you're not suppressing them. That's very different. No. And that's very difficult and stressful. And uh, my, my boy and others that I've talked to have explained that it's like if you, you know when you've got a hose on and you've got a kink in it and yeah. the, the water's like building up, building up, eventually it's just going to explode. So he's like, yes. like, I can hold it into a point, but it's all going to come out. So if I hold yeah. it in for this next hour, the same number of ticks will come out in a big burst afterwards. Yeah, and I think people telling someone to stop their ticks can it's itself be stressful for that person. And if they're feeling stressed and anxious and self-conscious about their ticks, they're going to tick more, yes. right? Yeah, one of the biggest triggers. So, for example, I my ticks and my Tourette's has been quite mild the last few years mm -hmm. up until this new career trajectory of being a keynote speaker and an ambassador mm -hmm. for Tourette's. Mm -hmm. I'm always talking about it. Yes. I'm always... In, you know, being asked about it. I'm always thinking about it. So therefore my ticks are going through the roof because talking yeah. about it, thinking about it, people asking you questions about it. Yeah, of course. Know, they're, they're triggers. <laughs> so yeah, if you ask someone to stop it, they're like, oh, oh, and they're in that little loop of don't do it, don't do it, don't yes. do it, don't do it, which yes. is a huge build up and then a pop. Yes. Which is yeah. good. No, that's right. So I also wanted to raise another misconception, which I did hear a little bit from certain people when, when my boy was first diagnosed and that's, oh, don't worry, he'll grow out of it. And I, I have some thoughts about this, but I want to ask your thoughts about that sort of statement, Seamus. <clears throat> well, when I was first diagnosed, the doctor did say it would leave by the time I was 18. Mm. Well, I'm 31. Mm. So, and I'm still ticking like a Swiss watch. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what happens, and if, if I refer back to the earlier statement of girls, girls are more able to mask it. Yes. I think as you get older and going back to what I said before, by being 31, I've got 31 years of experience. Yeah. You know, if if my career now was not around Tourette's, they would be so mild to the yeah. point where people wouldn't notice. Yes. So, you know, if I was a banker, right, yep. and I said, I've got Tourette's, they'd be like, what? I've never <laughs> noticed it. <laughs> yeah. And maybe because the research isn't being done around it, mm. they, you know, they interview them later or whatever and say, oh, they're not here anymore mm. because... Mm -hmm. You've just gotten so much better at masking, manipulating, mm -hmm, redirecting, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so, mm. I, I, yeah, I don't. It doesn't go away. In my, in what I've noticed, mm. it does not go away. You just get better at handling it. Yeah, and I like I when uh, my boys was diagnosed and start telling people, it was amazing the number of people like, oh yeah, I have that, or oh, my my uncle has that, or oh, my partner has that, and I'd like, what? I've been around these people. I have never noticed this, and they'll say, yeah, it comes out for some of these people when they're tired or really stressed, they will mm -hmm. sort of come out a little bit, but most people wouldn't notice. And um, one person I met said they had, like you, Seamus, just realised they'd come up with just little ways they could move their body and do things to just redirect them. And they were just sort of subconsciously doing that all the time now. So, again, you wouldn't notice that they had it, but it hadn't gone away in the people that I've spoken to either. Yeah, it's so funny. I think it's important also just to say that that message of you'll grow out of it, it's not helpful no. because that's not, you know, that is not leading to that acceptance journey. Yes. This is my issue with it. Yeah, and you're putting it on the box, you're putting it on the shelf for later. 
mm. oh, don't worry about it. It'll go. It'll be gone in the yes. year. Because yes. I remember I would look forward to my 18th birthday yeah. because I it would have gone away yes. apparently. Yes. And I remember being 18 going, well, I don't have Tourette's anymore. And then I was 19 and 20 and I'm like, but yeah. I still have ticks. Yeah. Maybe it's not. And then I was like, oh, but it's weaned off or waned or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then over, over the few years I was like, but I still have it and I'm 25. Yes. So, yeah, it, 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 I guess it would give you a false hope and yes. you put it in the back burner for, eh, it'll be gone anyway, so who cares? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm very careful never to say this to my child. Some people have said it to me, but I don't think anyone's really said it to him, which is good. Because, yeah, we, we want to be fostering that acceptance, not, oh, yes, this is a problem that will get fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we've got another misconception. I'm going to take this one. Okay. But before I say that one, I'll just, you know, reiterate the other one that we mentioned was about the swearing and yelling obscenities and that that is far less common than people probably um, are thinking. Mm-hmm. So the last misconception we have here is that you won't be able to work and or lead a normal, quote, unquote, life. So what would you say to that, Seamus? You've got a lot to say on this topic. Yeah, well, I think it's absolute BS. I think that's so false. I don't think that's, I don't think that's even remotely close to being accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that all falls down on the individual and Mm. uh, and what their adversity that they face and what I like to call a self-appointed setback. And this is my whole mission, my whole statement Go for my new, is that is that you can achieve absolutely anything that you want yep. and it's it, you put your own roadblocks in your life. So you, you, I, it really breaks my heart when I meet someone who thinks I can't do this because mm. of X, Y, Z, whatever it might be. And then you look at so many successful stories where – they just learnt how to manage it or they got through it or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. But when I hear someone say, oh, I can't do that because I've got ADHD, I've got mm-hmm. autism, mm-hmm. I've got whatever it might be, it, it, it really breaks my heart because, yep. you know, I, I failed school. So in the eyes of society, I was a dumbass mm-hmm. and, you know, I have ADHD. I couldn't sit still. Mm-hmm. I could barely read or write. Mm-hmm. Having Tourette's, like there's no way... I could have thought being on television and being a television presenter mm-hmm. was possible because like it or not, society doesn't want to r- r- wake up in the morning and get the weather report from a guy who's ticking like crazy. Mm-hmm. And I just, my very career defies that mm. and, 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 and it makes that statement a myth. Yep. And I actually have a meeting with someone tomorrow who is a founder, he's a CEO, he's a very successful entrepreneur and he has Tourette's. Same thing, was born with it. Yep. And and I just think there are so many really successful people out there who have a condition mm-hmm. that they have not let that condition be a self-appointed setback. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think it's absolutely ridiculous to mm-hmm. put that on someone to say you can't live a fulfilling life if yeah. you have Tourette's. I yeah. mean, don't get me wrong, there are some really extreme conditions mm-hmm. where maybe that individual really struggles to manage the ticks and they are completely debilitating mm. and then that's a really a really difficult uh, situation for that person mm-hmm. and hey that's their journey mm. um, but I, I hate it when someone puts puts a leash puts a wet sock puts a weight mm. you know puts something to stop someone from doing something because yeah. it's ridiculous you can do anything you want anything yeah yep. we hate it too we agree <laughs> with you 100 <laughs> percent. I mean, I do. I do make a joke that I probably can't be a sniper. I mean, you know, <laughs> suppressing it for two days. There may be I'll some I... things that you probably shouldn't do. But yeah, yeah, you can okay. do it if you want, mate. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> it's not going to be enjoyable for you. Yeah, you can. You just shouldn't. <laughs> um, I I can't help myself. I have to throw in there that. As squares listening know, uh, my PhD was in biology, but I failed my first biology exam in high school. So I am also yeah. proof of. Do you, don't let these things set you back. If you want it, you go and get it. So mm, Yes, I was told in high school, don't bother trying to get into, you know, X university, which is one of the top universities, because you won't you won't have a score that's high enough. Uh. Well, look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, I mean, if you go around saying to everyone, you can be the next CEO or you can be this amazing XYZ. Mm-hmm. 
it can give someone false hope. Yeah, I think people have to really work out what they want to do and then yeah. they can achieve it if they want. But, you know, often you do need some support to get there. Mm. That's a big part of it. But it's so awesome to see someone like you, Seamus, who has achieved so much. So we did want to ask you what it was like working in TV and radio with Tourette's. Um, it was a real challenge. Thankfully, the television crew were quite good. So they knew and yep. I would say, just wait. And, you know, before recording, I'd get... I, what I chose to do is chose when to do my ticks. Mm-hmm. So I would go, okay, I'm about to do something. So I'd let all my ticks out. I'd get them done. I'd do them. And then I'd go into this, you know, four-minute segment. Yep. And then I'd do them afterwards. Mm-hmm. That might fall into the category of masking. Uh, sorry, suppression. Yep. I don't know. But I remember thinking, oh, I'll do them now. Mm-hmm. And I'll do them afterwards. Mm-hmm. And so I was still doing them. And then I started, because I, I think it might have been suppressing because I remember feeling frustrated, oh, waiting to stop recording so I could let them out. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was suppressing. Mm-hmm. And then I had to learn, hang on, this is a 10-minute interview. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to not do it. So that's when I learned the whole butt clenching, stomach rolling, stomach clenches, tensing of the legs and things. And, like, uh, for example, clicking my fingers is one. And instead of doing the click, it was massaging my fingers okay. and getting that sensation. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so that's when I had to really learn that I still want to get that sensation, but mm-hmm. I'm being watched. And so that was a real challenge, mm. to be honest. So that was on air. But off air, there was a lot of work required. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of writing scripts, a mm-hmm. lot of sitting in front of a desk, a lot of researching, reading, writing, mm. concentrating mm. for eight hours a day. And fresh out of school, where I did not do that, yes. sitting in front of a desk, oh, man, did I get into trouble mm. because I didn't do any work until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd be <laughs> up out of my desk all the time. I'd be having four-hour lunch breaks, like, you know, chronic ADHD kid mm-hmm, mm-hmm. trying to work 9 to 5 at 18. And it just, it, I, that was a real challenge for me. Mm. So I had to really learn how to, first, I had to teach myself how to read and write. Mm-hmm. So Because literally the scripts, I remember my boss pulling me aside saying, Seamus, you're not in school. Like, you can't write this sentence. That sentence does not grammatically make sense. Mm-hmm. I know we're only reading it and it's just for us, but you, you, cannot, you cannot be putting things forward like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so the big difference I learned between the professional world, and I was very fortunate to learn this at 18, because mm-hmm. a lot of people don't go into the professional world until about 21. When you underperform at work, you don't get detention you don't get failed marks. Mm. You get fired and you get a poor represent, a rep, rep, yes. uh, uh, reputation. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's the word. So it falls on you. And I remember learning that so quick going, hang on, I really want this career. Yes. I was so, I was full of aspiration, so confident and like I had such big dreams and I was like, all right, well, if I want to be the next row of live, I've got to make sure my, scent, my grammar is correct. Yes. And so I literally, the first thing I did was my texting. So instead of text language, I was uh, like, well, okay. if I'm texting... 50 times a day, mm-hmm. I may as well text correctly mm-hmm. and use correct grammatta. Uh, mm-hmm. Grammatta, for goodness sake. <laughs> use correct grammar. Yes. And sentence structure and spell every word correctly. Yes. And that was the first thing. And, and then Janine I would, appreciates that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, oh, my gosh, I'm a stickler for the people using the wrong theirs. Yeah. One, look, oh, once, and, you, once you go across that threshold, there's no turning back, Shagness. <laughs> yeah, and when yeah, people... This one, yeah, this one really gets me is when people use is and are wrong. Like mm-hmm. there is a pair of pants over there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there are a pair of pants. And I have to stop myself because I correct people all the time. Yeah. And I, in fact, to the point where I, I, I know it's socially unacceptable at a dinner table when someone says, you know, the plate is... Oh, the plates is over there. I go into myself. The plates are over there. <laughs> like, because uh, I'm still going to get that little win over them, you know? Yep. <laughs> um, yes. I yeah. I get so it. That- Look, we understand these things. <laughs> Absolutely. But that was, that was a real challenge for me, mm. um, was actually the ADHD side of things in a professional environment. Yes. And thankfully, I think because Tourette's is so visual, other than when I first got the job, the, my boss pulled me aside and said, why do you keep twitching? Because uh-huh. I didn't tell them. I wasn't forthcoming. Yep. I didn't tell people I when I got my license. I I just lied. I didn't mm-hmm. tell them because I was like, I don't want to not get my license. Yes. I can drive. You know, I don't want to not do this job. Mm-hmm. I can do it. Mm-hmm. Like that's what I was born to do. Mm-hmm. So I lied because I didn't want them to think, ah, well, let's not let's not give it to him. Mm-hmm. It's a risk. So when they pulled me aside because they noticed it very quickly, they mm-hmm. were like, 
what's with the head movement, man? Mm-hmm. So do I've got to rest. And I thankfully I'd signed the contract. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they did they did threaten to fire me. They said, Well, you're still under probation. So mm. If it is a problem, then that's okay. You're under probation. We'll get someone else. And I was like, Gull. like mm. this is it. This is what I wanted. I was I wanted to be the Graham Kennedy. I wanted yeah. to be. That's for, that's an old reference. We know. We way, know who that is. Listening. <laughs> we know. Yep. <laughs> he was my idol for a very long time. I wanted to be Rove Life. I wanted to be yes. that person. So I knew. Okay, don't let Tourette's get in the way. Mm. So that's. I just had to make sure when I was on camera, I was in control of it. Mm-hmm. And that grew on to being in control of it. Therefore, I wasn't stressed about it. Therefore, mm. it wasn't a problem. Therefore, it didn't fester in my mind and mm-hmm. I wasn't insecure about mm. it because I could I could control it. It was fine. And, I mean, when you have something that's very visual, majority of the people are very accepting. Mm-hmm. Very rarely are you going to get someone in your adult life who mm. is going to put you down over it, yeah. not like you because of it. Um, they can mm. see it, you know. Mm-hmm. A- anyone in their right mind is going to go, I can see that, you know, mm-hmm. don't bring it up <laughs> or, yep. or whatever it might be. I don't know. I-, I never had a problem with people bringing it up. I used to, when I was younger and I would be in the, in the nightclubs. <laughs> <laughs> Seamus is dancing for all of our <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Getting his dance on, love it. And And I remember, and I don't know if I should say this, but I remember particularly this girl, she goes, why do you keep t- twitching like that? Mm. And I just said, oh, I just did a whole bunch of drugs. Just Aww. thinking it's better that she Aww. thinks that I did drugs yep. instead of having Tourette's. That might, mm. because I didn't want it to ruin my chances. But that, very, that never happens now. And that would, mm. only, that would only be in the formative years of going through that acceptance yeah. journey. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in fact, actually, that's a lie. Sometimes I change the topic or will lie when I can tell that that person is going to feel insecure or embarrassed by asking. Because oh, I'm not even okay. close to embarrassed, yes. insecure, or anything. But if they say, "Why yeah. do you keep twitching like that?" and I say, oh, "I've got Tourette's," I am so sorry. I'm like, oh, yes. I don't care. You didn't yeah. give it to me. Yeah, yeah. So you want I'd... to save them from feeling bad? Yes. Yes. So that's when yeah. I just go, "Oh, it's just something I do," and just or just like, mm-hmm. "Oh, okay. must, you know, whatever." Because I'm just I don't want to go through them feeling bad and apologizing. Yes. I don't care, mate. You didn't give it to me. It's not <laughs> contagious. Like, yeah. relax. It's not your problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've just got to, we've got to break down, you know, that stigma and taboo around lots of things. Yeah. This included. Well, this sort of leads on to the next question I wanted to ask, because I think some of our listeners might be wondering about research into potential treatments, which I have had a look into. But before we even get into that, I am interested in your take, Seamus. If a cure became available tomorrow, would you take it? No, absolutely not. Because I'm now past that acceptance journey yeah. where once I accepted it, you know, I then fell in love with it. Yes. Because it made me who I am. Amazing. And, and once upon a time, I wanted to be like everybody else. Mm-hmm. But now if I didn't have it, I would be like everybody else. <laughs> and I'm like, boring. <laughs> so... You know, yep. and that would really uh, limit my exciting dinner table conversations because I, <laughs> I, you know, I love talking about it. So, no, not at all. Yep. It's so interesting you're about to touch on um, mm-hmm. uh, treatment. Yep. So, I'm actually currently in the process of getting ADHD medication. Okay. The reason is now working for myself. Yep. I can't afford to get up 10 times in writing an email. Yep. I can't afford when I, I'm working for myself now. So, you know, uh, time not spent working is money lost. Mm-hmm. So for me, I want to take, even though after 31 years I've been able to manage my ADHD, mm-hmm. I've been able to learn when to hyper-focus, et cetera, mm-hmm. I still want to take away that annoyance and, mm-hmm. and, and, and just take away that decision I have to make with when I've got to make 30 a day. Mm-mm. So I'm now in that process. Now, I was speaking to the psychiatrist the other day and I was like, wait a second here. If I take a stimulant, that's mm-hmm. going to increase the ticks. And she goes, yes. Mm. So she actually just sent me some information to research the relation between ADHD stimulant medication Mm -hmm. and Tourette's Mm -hmm. and the relationship between them. I was also starting to think a little bit more about that and going, wait a second here. I have spent 31 years to manage these tics, Mm -hmm. manage my ADHD. Mm -hmm. 
if I had intervention or if I had therapy at a young age, just say it was medication, then the mo- I have to be reliant on that. Mm. So I remember thinking now, if I had ADHD medication at 10 and I did really well in school mm-hmm. and I became a lawyer, mm-hmm. well, then I'm going to need that medication to be able to continue in that job. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, well, in fact, if I have a child who has ADHD or Tourette's, mm-hmm. a part of me is like, you need that tool because the medication won't be there forever. Mm. Or you, you need that mm. tool to harness it, that what you have to learn naturally. And this is, my, this is what I've just thought of the last few days. Mm. You need to be able to harness it yourself. Otherwise, you're reliant on something else. And then you fall into the trap of going, I can't do that mm. because mm. I don't have this. Mm-hmm. And you put another self-appointed setback in the way. You mm. put another roadblock that you've put in, in front of you. And so I'm now at a crossroads going, whoa, maybe I don't want to fall into that medication trap mm-hmm. because I don't want to feel like I can't achieve without it. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, you have achieved a lot in all of the ways that you have already been managing things. One thing I meant to say before, but when you talk about how you can redirect the ticks, so different to yeah. suppressing them, that is a technique. We meant, we chatted about this a bit at camp called cognitive behavioural intervention therapy. So there are some practitioners who can take uh, clients with Tourette's and help teach them how to do that. So it's quite amazing that you worked that out all by yourself without any support. Well, yeah, I remember talking to you guys about that and mm. thinking, well, because I don't know anything about it other yeah. than what I learned at camp yes. from hearing uh, the psychologist. Yes. And I remember thinking, well, cause I didn't have any of that. I had to learn it myself. Yeah. And I remember thinking, does the person teaching that have Tourette's? Mm. Because mm. No. that's like, well, because I remember thinking like that's like teaching someone to drive when you don't drive yourself. <laughs> so this is a I good point. Like, I would really like to know how they came up with that therapy because I know nothing about it, mm. where, what the results are. I remember someone reaching out to me recently saying they, their, their child has Tourette's but they're managing it fine because they do see bit online. Really? Yeah, there's a therapy okay. online. I know nothing about it uh, other than what I read in the email. But there's apparently some online things for CBIT. Okay, interesting. Can you explain to me what CBIT is? Is it a person in a room saying exactly what I said before, when you get a tick, yeah, change pretty the way much. you do so it? So w- I haven't pursued it with my child. Um, and on that, I'm very careful to not say, I want you to see this specialist to fix your ticks. Mm-hmm. I will never do mm-hmm. that. I would. I will just, when he's... I don't know what age, I will just make him aware that these things are there and if he wants to access them, we can try. But also to be very clear that it may not work, it may not be effective, so there's no false help and that, you know, no one's expecting him to go and fix anything because there's no problem in my eyes. But anyway, it's basically what you did with yourself. It's someone training the person with Tourette's to identify a feeling like I need to do a tick and what exact tick is it and what is the Mm. sensation you need to get from that and then exploring all different ways to try and satisfy that need, like scratch the itch. That's what it is. So it is what you are doing. One one thing I have noticed looking back on my management Mm. is it is exactly that. It's management. So Mm -hmm. the moment I stop it, then my ticks are way more mm-hmm. aggressive because mm-hmm. I'm not doing it. It's mm-hmm. not. It's an active management, mm-hmm. and it's ongoing. Yes. So I remember the moment I left television. I was seven years on television. I did toasted TV, and then I did totally wild. Seven yep. years in total. I was in Adelaide. I quit my job, and I moved to Melbourne. Mm-hmm. And I was pursuing breakfast radio. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking I was laying in bed, and I got, and it was the first time. I had had a tick that wasn't even OCD related. So my left shoulder, which I've still got today, it's a left mm-hmm. shoulder one. Mm-hmm. And that developed then, must have been triggered by the trauma of quitting and moving to a mm-hmm. new city mm-hmm. without a job. That's when I, that's, that's when I experienced depression mm-hmm. and high anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that started. And I was like, why isn't it happening on the other side? That's weird. Mm-hmm. And then I remember thinking hey, I don't need to manage it anymore because I'm not on TV, so who cares? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, all right, I'm going to stop managing it then. And, yeah, I I stopped. I I kind of stopped managing my tics since then and they Mm -hmm. naturally kind of, I guess, there's always something subconscious where you manage, always. Mm. 
And then every now and then there's some slip through that you don't know. So it, yes. it's, it, it's definitely not, in my experience, it's not black and white. You can't mm-hmm. go, I've got the therapy, now that's it. I can I can manage them forever and yes, it's easy. Yeah. No one will notice. No, no that's not well, I know one of, I remember reading about it and they said, oh, if the tick is this, try tickling the roof of your mouth with your tongue. And that might work for that tick, but at any point a new tick can develop. So then you need to figure out a new way to deal with that. So I'll just really quickly go through some of the that research around the treatment. So there are a lot of trials going on looking at cannabis-based medicine, but there are no large randomised controlled trials, which would be the gold standard. So the jury is still out on this. And um, I think it's a pretty big call to be considering doing that with kids in particular because their brains are still developing. So we really want very good evidence that that is worthwhile if we even do want to try and treat this this condition. And there's also, in the extreme cases, deep brain stimulation has been used, but that's extremely invasive, obviously, and can be risky. And the results are quite mixed. So, and then obviously the, the CBIT, the Cognitive Behavioural Intervention Therapy that we've been discussing is another behavioural treatment. But really, at the end of the day, that we want to emphasise that there is no cure. And mm. we think, and we know Seamus agrees, that the real key to curing Tourette's is acceptance both from the individual with the Tourette's and the community at large. Yeah, I think it's, there's no cure for Tourette's, but there's a cure for your mindset towards it. Yes, yeah, it, and that's why I believe so strongly in the power of language because yes, with your language around it, it needs to be really positive and yeah. accepting and loving. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? Someone asked me this recently. They said, "Are you worried you're going to pass your Tourette's onto your child?" Mm. And I said, "Nope, sucked <laughs> in, bro. Your turn. <laughs> I dealt with it. You're on your own." <laughs> like, yeah, that's. I don't care. That's it. That's their journey, not mine. Mm. Everyone goes through a journey. Mm. And so it's a hard one because as a parent, I assume you want to intervene as much as possible, but this is something you can't intervene with. That's, that's mm. them. So if you start exploring, you know, the medication, the treatment and all that, mm-hmm. well, it's a hard one because it's not the parent's journey. It's mm. the individual's journey who has the Tourette's. Yeah, I think I can, I can remember the first t- maybe two months I was in a quite a negative well, I'm not negative, I'm just very anxious mindset about it. Like, I don't want this for him. What does this mean? What does his life now look like? I think there were so many unknowns for you, right? Yeah. And the neurologist we saw was actually really great because he said to me, I'm going to prescribe one thing and it's really important that you take it. And I'm like, okay. I'm thinking, oh, geez, I didn't think we'd be at the medication stage already. And he just said, I'm prescribing a chill pill for you. And you need to take it every day. And it was the best advice because I was like, okay, that that is actually a big part of this because me being worried about it is not helping anybody and it's not helping my child either. And so that was was a big uh, moment where I started to shift in my thinking about it. And uh, just can I ask you a question as a parent? Yes, of course. So I assume it's because it's out of your hands. What is it when you first got the diagnosis or when you started noticing it what was the fear what was what was other than what does it mean for him but as a parent what did it mean when your child was diagnosed it's it's very much about what other people think yeah okay that's what it's all about it's not about you you love your child unconditionally it's you don't have any change of feeling towards your child it is what are other people going to think what are other people going to say how is he going to be treated yeah, even you know, going is he going to be able him? to go to school? Because he was, it was just before he was to start prep, and I was like, oh, maybe we need to homeschool, and it was just catastrophizing all the things, and yeah, like, will he be able to have the job he wants? And it was all these things. So I can kind of answer all those questions now. That yeah, he can go to school. Of course, he can go to school, and he can do whatever job he wants when he works that out and also it's not up to me to say we need to treat this it's up to him to decide if he wants to pursue anything and so I keep taking those chill pills every day and they work very well <laughs> <laughs> one thing I will say to parents mm. um, something that my mother did which was both of my parents did which was really helpful for me was they never spoke for me so I see many mm. many times I will be introduced to a child and straight away the parent will say, this is blah, 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 he has X, Y, Z. And I'm not an idiot. Mm. I spot it a mile away and go, well, I can clearly tell 
your mm-hmm. child has a condition. Mm-hmm. It's almost like it comes with the parents give a disclaimer. Mm. And I dare say mm. maybe that's they're projecting an insecurity. Yeah. Because they're yeah, probably. worried about what you said before of what mm. other people will think. Yeah. yeah. But my parents never did that. So my parents always would just say, you know, this is Seamus. Or if I met another adult and they asked questions, why does he keep ticking or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. My parents would look at me. That's good. And they'd say, well, you know, how do you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. And what that did is it gave me the sense of ownership. Mm. So it was, if I wasn't feeling up to it, I would lie or I would not tell them about the Tourette's Mm -mm -mm. because I wasn't in the mood. Mm -hmm. And other times when I was confident, I would. Mm -hmm. So it gave me the ownership of this is mine. If Mm. I want to lie about it, I can. Mm -hmm. If I want to hide it, I can. Mm -hmm. If I want to be confident and show the world, I can. Mm -hmm. It was my decision because... I feel if my parents spoke for me, I'm like, oh, now they know. Like, yes. what are you doing telling them? Yeah, that's a good point. I think early on I was doing that. I was saying this is David and and saying it like, oh, and also he has Tourette's if you notice anything or if he makes some strange noises. I don't do it anymore. I would do exactly what your parents are saying. That was very early on. Again, I was just so worried. Oh, what are they going to think? What are they going to think of him? Or what are they going to think of my parenting in me allowing him to continue doing this strange mm, behaviour yeah. or whatever. Um, but now, yeah, I don't say anything and he can divulge to whoever he likes. Or not. <laughs> or, and yeah. do it in the way he wants to on that day. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I, I don't know what it's like to have coprolalia. Mm. I don't know. I, I think I might have some coprole... What is it called? Cop- cop- Copropraxia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so because I did that a lot as a child. Um, uh-huh. And there are some things that now that I'm learning so much more, I'm like, hey... That I do that all the time. <laughs> I copy people's words. Yes. I mimic people all the time. And I think that's called echolalia yes. when you copy people. My, my yeah. boy does that sometimes. Yes. And I didn't know any of this mm. when I was a child uh, and even till a year ago. And, mm-hmm. I'm, and when I listen and get to know more people, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just thought I did that. Yes. And, and, and there are so many people who have a tick and they don't realise. They say, like you said before, hey, I do that. My uncle does that. Yeah. And I thought the copying and the repeating and imitating people's words or saying a sentence was just me being weird. I didn't (laughs) know that was Tourette's. And there's actually, I've discovered I have a verbal tick that is triggered and I will never reveal what the trigger is. Okay. But I was watching (laughs) YouTube and I saw it. And I noticed over the last year when I watched that YouTube clip, I say it every single time. Oh. And after camp, I was like, hang on a second, that's a trigger. Yes. A, a, a verbal, because what's it called when it's words but not swearing? Uh, you know? Just be verbal ticks, I guess. Maybe, yeah. So I remember going, oh, my gosh, I've actually got that. I didn't realise. Yes. And sometimes I'll trigger it myself <laughs> by thinking, is it? And <laughs> that happens. And, yeah, yep. I'll be in my car and I'm like, oh, and I'll just do it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, the more I'm immersing myself in this community, mm. the more I am learning. As someone as 31 has had it my whole life, yep. I'm still learning about it myself. Yeah. Awesome. So, Seamus, can you tell us what is the best parts about having Tourette's? I think... The jokes that come with it for me, <laughs> having done stand-up comedy, <laughs> yes, it gives me so much material that other people can't use. Awesome. Love Everybody it. can talk about dating, parenting, mm. you know, whatever. Not many can talk about Tourette's. That's true. So, You're very niche. <laughs> yeah, that really gave me an upper hand. I also think in my dating life when I was insecure about it or I'd hide it, whatever, but when I was confident and I would tell them. The common theme amongst the people I was dating, they always said, I like it. I, I like it. It's a, it's a cute quirk. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's adds character and yep. it, it gives you more depth. And so I found with the right people, mm-hmm. it improved their attraction to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that gave me an upper hand again. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I think... I say this a lot in my keynote. I say everybody is faced with adversity, Mm -hmm. but it's up to you if that adversity is a flaw or a strength. You will always Mm -hmm. have that adversity. Mm. And adversity is something someone struggles with, right? It could be an insecurity that you've created yourself, like I don't like my ears, 
or it could be a condition you're diagnosed with. It could be whatever, a story, a, a traumatic experience that's happened. But you're always going to have it, always. It's up to you if it's a flaw or a strength. Mm. So with Tourette's, you have to find what the positives are yourself because my positives might not be some for someone else. Mm, that's so good for point. me, yeah. the jokes are not the best thing for someone who is not in, has doesn't have the same sense of humour, yes. doesn't fall into the comedy world. Mm. Maybe they don't like the jokes, right? Yes. I do. So I think the best thing for me is not the, necessarily the best thing, thing for someone else. Yep. And that comes under that acceptance journey. Yeah, I have learned it's like a jerk repellent because it just <laughs> really weeds out. Like if anyone has an issue with it, I just know straight away, like, well, you're not in my life and that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I think it's really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I, I feel the same way when I think about it's part of what makes a person who they are and I, I kind of, that's how I think of my nephew, you know, this mm. is part of him and he's such a cool kid and I love him so much mm. and I wouldn't change anything about him. Mm-hmm. You're, you're so right about a jerk repellent mm. because if someone that you meet can't, either one, they can't see past the ticks, mm-hmm. well then, yeah, you're right, screw them, yeah. shove them to the curb. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's the same with dating. If they can't get past that, well then they're probably not going to be a very nice person to partner up with. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Even I'm single mum, if I'm dating someone and they have an issue with it, it's great. I'm like, good, let's just make sure they know about this straight away because if they have an issue, see you later. Yeah. yeah. No time or, wasting. <laughs> yeah. Or it gives you a chance for them to open their minds and it gives you mm. a chance for someone else to grow in a particular area. True. So, yeah, actually because it's such a visual thing, it's such a surface-related issue. Yes, true. So you can either get rid of people on the surface or educate people on the surface to look past it. Yes. And we'll talk a little bit more about camp soon, but when we go to camp where it's families where at least one person in the family has Tourette's Mm. and the first sort of afternoon and night is quite intense because everyone is, (laughs) what what are we there for? We're there for Tourette's. We're talking about Tourette's. They're all ticking and it's just like positive feedback going crazy. There's a lot of it's quite intense. But even in that situation, after a while, you just get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just becomes normal and it's just like kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it's incredible watching, watching everybody's ticks go, you know, ramp right up. And I remember yes. <laughs> I was at a camp and there was a talent show. Yeah. <laughs> and now, obviously... If, you're, if you don't have much experience with Tourette's and you walk into a Tourette's camp and there are 20 <laughs> kids there with coprolalia, yes. and you walk past them and they give you the finger and say some of the most <laughs> offensive <laughs> oh, sentence yeah. in the world yep. <laughs> about someone's mother. <laughs> and it's like a beautiful 16-year-old girl who's like so sweet and innocent and then just gives me the finger and says, F your mother's vagina. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah. <sighs> but if you're not used to that, right, it's a shock. But then you get used to it because you're like, oh, this is called Tourette's and it's fine. Yes. But I yeah. remember <laughs> I was at a camp and there was a, um, a talent show and this sweet girl got up and she was doing a lovely dance and everybody with Caprolali was like, you suck, <laughs> F you, yeah. get off the stage, you're fat. <laughs> I hate you, you're mo-. like the most yep. full yeah. abuse. <laughs> but because it was so normal... Everyone was just ignoring it and like clapping, and it was. And I had a moment of like, if this was in any other situation, this is the most traumatic time. But even the girl dancing at the front, it didn't affect her. No, and she, she didn't care. Like flamboyant up the front. Yeah, I just thought it was so funny. And if someone who didn't know yep. came in, that'd be like this poor girl is being horribly yep. ridiculed. But those people who have those ticks, they're clapping, they're loving oh, yeah, it. They're, they're actually so involved. super supportive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, I Sometimes know, so. you'll hear them sort of going in and out of ticks and, and not and saying like, you suck, get off. No, oh, you're actually really good. I'm so sorry. You're actually really amazing. Get off the stage. <laughs> yeah. I know. Actually, on that note, Seamus, I wanted to ask you, yeah. you, you do your public speaking now. What's it like giving a talk to a crowd of people with Tourette's syndrome? Yeah, compared you know, to your, to doing a talk with a group that doesn't necessarily have it. It's great training um, <laughs> because yeah. you got to know what you're talking about because mm. it was very, very distracting being, you know, for an hour constantly yelled at with profanity. <laughs> mm. And the funny thing is the biggest challenge for me was 
doing stand-up comedy, I used to encourage people to heckle. I encouraged mm. it because I, I would use my wit and backfire and involve them. And, and I would, for me, that was a way of sourcing comedy. And doing my talk at the camp and in front of people with Tourette's, it took everything inside of me not to respond uh, because yes. it would just continue down a cycle. Because yes. once, you, once you respond to someone's tick, then it's going to trigger it again. Yes. And so I'm going to fall into this loop of just responding to people who mm. are yelling profanity at me. Mm-hmm. Every now and then I can't resist. I remember the first one I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was talking and we're asking questions and this young girl just goes, how many dicks do you have? And I just went, one. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone laughed and it was just so, I couldn't resist. I just answered it. Yeah, I remember that one. Me too. It was last <laughs> yeah. year. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I the first time I arrived so we've been to three camps Alina has come along for the last two and yeah. the, the first I've just arrived and I was you know like okay how, how, how what's this going to be like how is this going to be and this someone came straight up to me and just went why are you even here you mega nerd <laughs> Just like, I don't even know I'm a Megan. I had you pegged. It's like, hello. Um, And I ended up speaking to that person quite a lot. They were absolutely lovely. But, yeah, so that was my first experience of Tourette's Camp. Yeah. It's quite funny. You know what's another really interesting um, lesson I had to learn after meeting a lot of people with Tourette's? When I went to camp and I became an ambassador and I got to know a lot of the people and I was like, oh, I don't have coprolalia. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, I don't have coprolalia and these kids do. And I felt as an ambassador and what I'm doing inadequate because I didn't Mm. have it so severe. And Mm -hmm. I remember feeling a bit of imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. and going, Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, and losing confidence Mm. because I was like, oh, no, but I don't have what they have, therefore... I shouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I, I go to a psychologist very regularly. I don't go to get well. I go to stay well. So mm. I, I see a, col- a psychologist once a month. Mm-hmm. And I brought that up with him. And it was such a great lesson for me because I was like, hang on. And I, I actually did a talk a few months, a few weeks before this moment where before they introduced me, they said, look, everybody's faced with something. Some mm-hmm. are bigger than others. And I remember thinking, hang on, that, that's unfair. Because sure, to an outsider, uh, some are bigger than others. But to that individual, whatever they are going through, that's the biggest thing mm. in their life. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, hey, I can't let anyone else take what I've been through away from me. Mm-hmm. I, Tourette's mm. has still been adversity that I've faced. Absolutely. It's still been a roadblock. It's still been something I had to overcome. So I remember having to psychologically get over that self-appointed setback of feeling like mm. an imposter because I didn't have coprolalia mm-hmm. and, and really thinking, hang on, doesn't matter what, and, and, and in the scale of Tourette's or ADHD or autism or whatever it might be, just because you might be on the lower end, mm. don't let anyone take it away from you mm-hmm. or belittle it or, yep. or, you know, brush it off because it's not as severe as someone else. And that was a really strong lesson I learned quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, whatever someone's going through, it doesn't matter what it is, it's huge to that person. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Don't don't take it away from anyone. Yeah, Yeah. that reminds me, we did an episode about crying in humans and I can remember us learning about, you know, whether it's a first world problem or a third world problem. It's still a problem and it's still difficult and you're it's okay to be challenged by it. Yeah, I, I that is something I've always struggled with. I will cry at a drop of a hat if it's happy. <laughs> Right, uh-huh. seeing seeing my, you know, a, a, my a soldiers come home from Afghanistan mm. to their kids on YouTube. Oh my gosh, I'm crying. <laughs> Something sad happens. Whoosh, war cannot really? sad cry. Mm. Can only happy cry. Okay, and I'm dealing with that with my son. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you can go listen to that episode. It's quite cool. We get into the evolution mm. of it, of course. I love that. All right, it's time for our Inner Square segment where we reveal what has brought out our Inner Square recently. Seamus is sticking around and he's going to join in. Yay! Woo-hoo! So, Yay! Yep. <laughs> Seamus, you're our guest. So would you mm. like to go first or would you like a Janine oh and me goodness. to pave a nice nerdy pathway for you and be <laughs> the first nerds in line? <laughs> yeah, be the first nerds because right. I've got to think about what's gonna what, what I've nerded All out right. about recently. Get your okay. nerd brewing while I'll just tell you actually <laughs> mine mine is related to 
Tourette's Camp because okay. at Tourette's Camp, we signed up for the circus skills activity. Yes. Now, Seamus, I think you had a crack at this too. Mm-hmm. We didn't know what it would involve beforehand. I wondered if we might be balancing on top of elephants or getting shot out of cannon. <laughs> I wasn't sure. But <laughs> what it was was a whole bunch of stuff like juggling, spinning plates, um, Diablo, which I remember from school. There were Mm -hmm. other skills too, but the thing that David and I really loved was the trick sticks, also called devil sticks. This is where you are holding a stick in each hand and using those two sticks to do all sorts of tricks with a third stick. And it was so much fun. And I can now report that David and I both have our own set of trick sticks. I'm holding them Hooray! up here for, <laughs> for you to see on the Zoom. And we have been practising a little bit together. Yes. And we're mm. talking about preparing a joint act maybe to do at next year's Tourette's camp. It's in the works. Yes. <laughs> My people are talking to his people, a.k.a. Janine. <laughs> but, yeah, what I think is really nerdy is that, you know, I'm a woman in my late 20s slash early to mid 30s who's now watched several YouTube videos on trick sticks for beginners oh. and I'm spending a part of each day doing trick sticks and loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great activity for people with Tourette's because it gets you into that flow state, into that zone mm. where you can focus on that skill and, you know, with certain engrossing activities, the mind is fully occupied on that and I think it can reduce ticks or even um, stop them completely during that activity with activities like this. So I've been reflecting Mm. on that as well as just having heaps of fun tossing sticks around my living room. (laughs) Yeah. That is all. Yes, I I also wanted to just point out, you've neglected to say that we one of the activities was the spinning plates. I did say spinning plates. Yes, but you didn't elaborate because this is one of the only things squares will know that Alina is always amazing at all sport. Or anything she puts her mind to, she's amazing at. But this is one of those few things I was better at than Alina. So I just had to, I just had to throw that in there. I had and I, it out. I was just I've forgotten. like, oh, this is amazing. And it really was that flow state because I remember yep. the instructor going, okay, like we got two minutes, pack up. And we were all like, what? Have we gone that was for an, an hour, hour already? Are you serious? He knew we were yep. such nerds. <laughs> I, I think most people had left and it was they just had. us it three. It was only the three of us. Me left. with my plate. <laughs> Yeah, so I I just wanted to point out that Alina tried the spinning plate and then couldn't do it, so then got obsessed with trick sticks. One of what, like three things that I'm better at you? Yeah. Better at than you? (laughs) Yeah, potentially. (laughs) We're talking sport-wise. We're talking sport-wise. Anyway. What tricks can you do then? Have you been practising? I have. So I'm I'm throwing it up in the air, doing rotations one way, rotations the other, then doing um, sort of spinning back towards myself. Then there's this lovely Mm -hmm. one where you hold them up and let the let the stick roll down your arms and then come onto your shoulders and then go back again. It looks quite lovely. Mm. It is cool. Um, yeah, there's a few. Oh, and then tossing it back to one another between me and David. Mm-hmm. Yep. David's been tossing it in the air and catching it behind his back. Oh, that it's is pretty very impressive. impressive. That is He's doing well. <laughs> yes. So uh, are we ready for my inner square? You're up, Jenny. Yes. All right. So mine is, I can't remember how I came across this, but it was a blog piece written by Kelly Cordes, entitled The Fun Scale, which she describes this scale first being outlined to her by her friend Peter. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can read the actual blog, but she just, they've categorised all of life into three types of fun. (laughs) Oh, wow. So I'll just outline this. So type one fun, and a lot of this will be just me uh, reading directly from the blog. So type one fun This is enjoyable while it is happening. It is also known simply as fun. (laughs) This could be good food, margaritas. I'll throw in there hanging out with your best mates, watching your favourite movie, going to a concert. Trick sticks. I think we can all appreciate type one fun. Yep. (laughs) Just simply fun. Type two fun, on the other hand, this is miserable while it's happening, but fun in retrospect. It usually Mm. begins with the best of intentions and then things get carried away. Riding your bicycle across the country, doing an ultra marathon, working out until you vomit. Also, surely familiar to mothers at least during childbirth and the dreaded teenage years. And I can definitely relate to the childbirth example. Um, Alina will remember, Alina was there at my birth when, do you remember afterwards I said... 
that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, but I don't think I want to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) And then type three fun, this is not fun at all, not even in retrospect. Afterwards, you think, what the hell was I doing? If I ever come up with another idea that's stupid, please someone slap some sense into me. And this can include failed relationships that lacked type one fun. (laughs) And they also had an example of writing a book and I'll throw in there writing a thesis. I don't think writing a thesis is fun (laughs) and I don't think it's type two fun. No. No. So Um, type three fun is a type of fun that is defined by it not being fun at all. Well, the key, Alina, is that all life is being defined as a type of fun. (laughs) So type three fun is just not fun. This is silly. But wait a second. (laughs) Is type three fun a sense of achievement? No. Type 3 fun is just bad. Oh. <laughs> That's what makes this quite because silly. But it's, it's <laughs> kind of funny because it's kind of being packaged as like a scientific thing, but it's exactly. it just sounds this, so these silly. These are the sorts of random things I'm drawn to. So yes. um, obviously I'm now just categorising my life in this way. So I would like to reflect on, Alina, our recent trip, impromptu trip to buy clothes for my child, which was quite... Quite the intense car karaoke session. Oh, I'm calling it type one fun. That was fun. type one fun. It was just simply sure. fun. Yes. Um, whereas recently, I haven't told you about this, Alina, I was in the CBD and I didn't realise how low my tank was in petrol. And just as I realised, my phone also went flat. So I lost the ability to call anyone and I lost my Google Maps mm. to get out of the CBD. Yes. Now, look, at the time that was quite stressful and not fun, but now it's quite funny. Type two fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's type two fun. All right. All right. So that's my inner square. That is very silly, but I'm having type <laughs> one fun listening to it. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right, Seamus. What is it? Has All something right. brought out your inner square that you would like to share with the squares listening in? Yeah, I'll let you pick either fish <laughs> or power of language. Oh, that's really These impossible things, for me to choose because I like both of those. Alina, you choose. These are two things that I, I've been nerded out on. Well, sorry. These are two things that have taken my attention and I've really invested a lot of this time is it. And This is what into. it's all about. You understand the segment well. <laughs> I'm drawn to the fish, but I think we need to hear about the power of language because we have talked a bit about this in the episode already. Yeah, so true. it's really important. So let's hear it. Well, since taking up my keynote speaking career, I've really explored the power of language to yep. improve your confidence. So a technique that I used for stand up comedy was actually putting myself down. Oh. So I'd say, You're not funny. No one's going to laugh because I didn't want to have a high expectation. Because if no one laughed, that was my expectation. But if they did laugh, that was a win. So I would walk around and I would, I would control my nerves and I would say, this is going to suck. No one's going to laugh. It's not going to be funny. <laughs> and actually that worked for me. Now, when it came to being a keynote speaker, before every session, I would say, you are going to dominate. This is going to be excellent. You oh. are going to go so well. You're going to remember everything. Because I had to program my brain to be hyper-confident oh, and, yes. and really build myself up to have that energy, bam, yep. because I, it was a different result for keynote and stand-up comedy. Mm. So I had to come up with these confidence-building techniques that I have now explored so much more. So every single day I do a gratitude journal, mm-hmm. which I just appreciate little to big things in my life, right? At least three things. And it could be I like my watch, Thank goodness I'm not paying rent at the moment while living with mum and dad. <laughs> or it could be the breakfast I just ate. Yeah. Whatever it is. And then it goes into my inner child, messages to my inner child. Mm, that's nice. And I have battled for so long with negative self-talk. Mm-hmm. So my whole television and radio career, I would always fall into little depressive states where I, I suck, I'm not good, I'm mm-hmm. never going to make it, this sucks, I'm not funny. And now I am forcing my brain to think differently. So... I did it today where messages to my inner child of feeling those insecurities of mm-hmm. I'm not funny, I don't deserve this, mm-hmm. to you are great. And I write them down. Mm-hmm. Message to your inner child, you are great, you are funny, you deserve success. Mm-hmm. And what I found that did is it boosted my confidence up instantly. Awesome. I, my chest puffed up and I experimented with this with a horse. Okay. I went horse riding up in Noosa. Oh, yes. I did see this on and social media. I think I know what this is about. <laughs> now, being on Totally Wild, I, I interviewed a girl who I said, what are you studying? And she goes, 
animal telepathy. And I said, be careful who you tell that because you sound crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got, yeah, and then I got real rabbit hole deep on YouTube of people who can speak to animals. Yes, like horse whispering. No, we're talking telepathically oh, oh, speaking to animals. Yes. Okay. And I'm like, this is BS. <laughs> this is a science podcast. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay. And I watched it and it was very impressive if it's true. Right? <laughs> I'm not saying it is or it isn't. Okay. But one thing I took away from it was the, the, this lady went to a panther and she spoke to this panther tele, telepathically. <laughs> anyway, she left. And the zookeeper was at the panther and just randomly said, geez, you are beautiful to the panther. Mm. You are amazing. You are such a powerful animal. And instantly the animal, uh, its chest puffed up. Later, the lady came back mm -hmm. and said, the panther heard what you said and thanked you for those mm. positive messages. Now, in terms of science, what a load of BS. <laughs> <laughs> I experimented with this with a horse when I went riding with a horse. And afterwards, I went up to the horse and I looked at it. I got so close. I got to the ears. Mm -hmm. I got to the, nose, the, the eyes and I said, thank you. You are awesome. You were such a great animal. Thank you so much. And it instantly went <laughs> and nuzzled up against me. And now... I think people take that too literally of understanding me because it doesn't speak English. But I dare say there is an energy mm. of positivity mm -hmm. that I projected that it was able to read and understand what a mm. nice, lovely thing you're giving to yeah. me. Mm -mm -mm. And I have now taken that so much further mm. and I do it to myself. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I mentioned this at camp. So my dad did an experiment on tomatoes. Mm -hmm. He got five tomatoes, cut them all in half and put them in separate bags. One half said bad, the other half said good. Okay. And for about two weeks, my dad walked past them four to ten times a day. Yeah. would pick up the bad one and say, you suck, you <laughs> ugly tomatoes, I hate you. <laughs> and to the good ones, said, you are beautiful, ripe, lovely, juicy tomatoes. Okay. Within two weeks... The ones that said bad were horrible, mouldy, disgusting, rotten tomatoes. And the ones he said nothing but good things to mm -hmm. were still ripe. They were wow. perfect. And there's actually the technique behind speaking to your plants to encourage their growth. Yes. Well, I've heard about this. We haven't looked into this. Look, it sounds like you need to ask your dad if he wants to get involved in doing some experiments with us because, we, <laughs> look, we're all for this. We can do some experiments. We can, we can start getting some statistical power behind this, start investigating what's going on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just re that's, that's what I've nerded out about recently because I was like, that seems pretty impressive because it seems airy-fairy. Mm. Just think positively and the world will revolve around you. And I, I've, always, I've always thought negatively towards those vision boards of just put it out into the universe. I'm like, no, you've got to work. Yeah, you want the manifesting to... BS, yeah. Yes. However, I think manifesting falls into thinking positively towards yourself and something you want so you drive towards it and actively, yeah, proactively right. work on it. Yeah. Yes. And then it comes there. There's, anyway, a, there's a lot of research around um, the power of self-talk, absolutely. Mm. And everyone does negative self-talk. And a lot of people aren't even as aware of just how much they do it. Yeah. So the fact that you are really aware of it and actively changing it, you will see huge benefits in your life. And I just want to say thank you for being so open about all of these things, mental health, self-awareness. It's really good. It's really yeah. important that people are breaking down the stigma and talking about this because we all go through these things and there's no shame in any of it. Yeah, I, I think so. And thank, thank you for having me. And just finishing on that psychologist side of things, of mm. if you're struggling with your mental health, the stigma of seeing a psychologist, mm. that will hold so many people back. Yeah. And yes. someone said to me years ago, they said, listen, if you see a psychologist, it doesn't mean you're suicidal. Just the same as seeing a doctor doesn't mean you've got cancer, yeah. you have a cold. That's right. But seeing a psychologist just means they will equip you you, you might have anxiety or stress mm. that you don't know how to deal with. Mm. So, yeah, anything I can do to encourage people to improve their own lives, yeah, absolutely, that's what I'm all about and that's my whole mission. Yep, yep. for sure. Absolutely. So on that note, Seamus, please tell everyone how they can get in touch with you and where they can hear your talks and your messages about overcoming adversity. SeamusEvans.com, mm -hmm. S E A M U S. E-V-A-N-S, a lot of people spell it with an H, but it's not. Uh, and on my Instagram and Facebook is Mr. Seamus Evans. Looks like Mrs. Emu's Vans because it's S-E-A-M-U-S. <laughs> <laughs> <S> <laughs> <laughs> 
I hadn't noticed that, but now that's all I'll see. Awesome. <laughs> Mrs. Emu's vans. <laughs> Brilliant. And we definitely encourage anyone who's interested in hearing Seamus speak, whether it's at their school, their workplace, whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. he's got brilliant messages that really are important for lots of people. It doesn't, it's not about Tourette's, it's about overcoming adversity, whatever it is that makes you feel different, makes you feel othered, makes you feel not good enough. Seamus is really inspiring. That's right. And I'll also throw in there that just that we've talked a lot about Tourette's camp. So we really highly recommend anyone out there who has Tourette's in their family to look into when the camps are held. So these are camps held in most states of Australia. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a common thing in other countries. We do have listeners all over the world. So if it's not, some of you might want to get involved in starting it because that's been the single most helpful thing for my family in just, yeah, embracing it and loving it and meeting our tribe. And it's really freeing, lovely experience going to camp. Yep. So can't recommend them more highly. Can I just add something to that? Yes. When, before becoming an ambassador and my whole radio career, I remember thinking when Tourette's Syndrome Awareness Week came up, oh, what's the point? Mm. Like, there's no cure. So what's the point of awareness? Mm -hmm. Uh, You're not raising money for a cure. It's just awareness. What's the point? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I brought that question up to Mandy, the pre- president of Tourette's Syndrome Association Australia. Yep. And she said, the awareness is so valuable because so many people don't understand what Tourette's is. Yes. Police don't know how to treat a tick attack. And, yeah, true. And um, paramedics don't know how to treat a tick attack mm-hmm. because they're untrained. Mm-hmm. Teachers don't know how to teach someone who has Tourette's mm-hmm. because they just think they're being disturbing and mm-hmm. disrupting the class. Yep. So there is such a lack of awareness which is actually negatively impacting people with Tourette's life. Mm. Also, to watch these kids come together and Mm. be totally accepted for their tics and let them out. Some of these kids are ostracised and Mm. are homeschooled because they can't go to school because of the bullying, because of whatever it is. And to see them come together and to see their confidence skyrocket Mm. and be so accepting with each other, it was so amazing. There was no naughty kid. Nothing went wrong. Everyone played nicely and I just remember thinking that is what this is all about. That is the power of awareness. Mm. That is what's so important. And, yeah, I agree. Couldn't encourage it more to go to a Tourette's Yeah, Yeah, it's such a fun and relaxed vibe and it's been awesome that Alina's been able to join us. So I would encourage other families to get more of the extended family to come along because it's it's just so much fun. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) It is. And like David says, he says to you that he's glad he has Tourette's because it means he gets to go to Tourette's camp. Yeah, he does. And I feel the same way. I get to go to Tourette's camp. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're ready to wrap up. So thank you so much, Seamus, for coming on board and being our very first guest. It's been so much fun having you on the episode. And I'd also like to do a big shout out to the other incredible Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia ambassadors. So Connor Macy, who is one of the ambassadors who's done really amazing work getting the awareness out there and various TV appearances and have loved meeting him at camp. And also James Sayers, who is also known as Twitch Ninja from Australian Ninja Warrior. So he also comes along to the camps across Australia and he organises lots of fun, really interactive and active activities for the kids. So having all of these ambassadors going along to camps and raising awareness. They're all so enthusiastic, lovely and warm and it's so awesome to see people who are just so proud to be themselves. And it's hard to express just how much it means to those with Tourette's and their families having you as our ambassadors. So thank you to all of those people and especially you, Seamus, for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. Woohoo! Awesome. The details for everything we've talked about will be available on our show notes on the website. You can follow along with us on Facebook, Twitter, and the Gram. If you are liking listening to Sister Doctor Squared, feel free to buy us a coffee via our Kofi page. We have all of the details for that on the Support Us page of our website. And that's it. See you next time on Sister Doctor Squared. Stay square out there. Bye.